welcome, welcome, welcome. You're listening to the Cash Prime Radio Show on KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Well, each week since actually, let's see, January 2017, that's about six and a half years every week, we have a show on business where we try to help people either teach something about business, learn something about business. Uh, we can have a founder, we can have a, star, a, a starter of a new company, a CEO, um, or we can just have somebody that knows a lot about certain area in business, and we try to teach you that each week. And every week somebody says that has never listened to their show, Ask Brian is spelled A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N. Nobody understands why it's spelled with an E. Those of you who have listened to the show, you probably have a very good idea why it's spelled with an E. But the people who have never listened to the show, they don't understand why it's called Ask Brian, and they certainly don't understand where the name Brian, B-R-I-E-N, came from, because Brian, the only Brian they know with an E, is from Ireland, and it's the O'Brien family, <laughs> O'Brien. <laughs> it's always about the pub. It's always about the pub. That's exactly right, and there is an O'Brien, there is a O'Brien's pub right at, down the street from me. I live in Marina Del Rey, it's on Lincoln Boulevard, it's a couple blocks away, so that's a little uh, plug for the O'Brien pub, so we're actually getting some business out of this. All right, so. You know what? We need to do a live remote broadcast. We need to do a live remote broadcast from the O'Brien pub to the S. Brian show. Only if I can drink a beer while I do it. Um, so. Um, you have to take that up with the SEC, counselor. Uh, I, I certainly can. As long as I'm not driving, I'm, I'm certainly legal to have a beer. All right, let's see. Uh, it is a prohibition, you know, this Maybe in 1918 it would have been a problem to 1932. So, oh, I think you need to look into the FCC regulations a little harder, but just not today. Today we're going to talk about the age. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tracy, oh, I... give us one reason why Brian is spelled with an E. Well, if I can only pick one reason, I am no dummy. I'm going with the engineer because the engineer is the number one E that we have on this show, right? Well, I actually thought you would have said if you only could pick one, you would have picked the one that you like from Olivia Newton job. Okay, we've got that going. Yeah, uh, well, remember that. I mean, when we skip that I over. Could only, <laughs> if I could only pick one, that might be it. But I'm a very strategic person, and I know where the show gets produced from, and it gets produced from the engineer. So, of course, I'm going to default See, to the engineer. I would, I, would, I would have selected another E that we use, okay, because this would have... Yes solve the problem, okay? It's called empathy. And if I empathize, that could have taken care of any hurt feelings to the engineer by skipping over the E. And I also oh. can take over everything. So that's how I think. But then again, I'm okay. a lawyer, so I think differently. All right. Yeah. So, give us, I didn't realize give us some he other... thought so empathetically, actually. I, that's a <laughs> shocker to me. <laughs> All right, let's so get what into the business with these days. We, actually, we, can't do, we cannot do the show without the engineer. That is correct. But we also cannot do the show without our experts that we interview each week. And that is really fundamentally the core of this show is um, the education that our experts bring to our audience. And we're always so grateful for that. And... I am enthusiastically well, happy to go through. Hold on. You're, 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 first of all, you're mixing two E's together, <laughs> but no, and you, you did that because you didn't want, because no, because I wouldn't have enough minded had you explained what, what you mean by the word expert <laughs> and what is qualified, because if you don't qualify <sighs> what an expert is, people might yes. not know who's never listened to the yes. show. Okay, so let me enthusiastically. Can you tell how enthusiastic no, I am about like this? An old, we bicker like an old couple. <laughs> we're like, yeah, we're just like an old married couple. Okay. <laughs> All right, already. I'm going to enthusiastically um, talk about the mathematical formula for what it takes to be an expert. But in all That's seriousness, a poor, our, poor way to use the word enthusiasm. But go ahead. It's like, yeah, kind of like, know, hi, was, my was, name is Bud. How are you? <laughs> It was next time we're gonna have chat, I'm going to use I'm going to use Chat GPI next time for enthusiasm. The way you said, it. All right, Chat so. GPI or Chat GPT? <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't okay, have an E in it, so I don't care. <laughs> okay, I'm not an expert in Chat GPT, but I do know what it's called. 
Um, anyway. <laughs> All right. An expert, by most people's definitions, is a person who has invested more than 10,000 hours of their life and livelihood in a specific niche or business category. Now, how that math is typically uh, developed is through the course of working somewhere around 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, over the course of approximately five years. But we don't really support that theory on the Ask Brian Show because every expert we've ever interviewed has been like, first off, <laughs> who works 40 hours a week when you are starting a business? And second of all, okay, yeah, maybe you take two weeks vacation, but you're probably working while you're on vacation because that's the American way, unfortunately. And then third off, if the pace of which most experts work, you could cover that in three years top, easy, like no problem. So our experts, regardless, have absolutely a lit, a, just a minimum of 10,000 hours in their field, and they can bring so much expert, expertise to the show. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are getting kind of late here, so we are going to have to go, go over the, the last three pretty quickly. Actually, there's four. So the four that I'm not so sure you recalled and because we don't have a lot of time today. So one... Our show is educational. We try to educate people each week. Oh, yeah, I flipped then that the one. Other, I flipped that one in. I did. Okay. Then, in addition to enthusiasm, we are excited! To begin the show. We are so excited, especially about our guest today, because she has got some powerhouse um, information to talk about today. And but everyone before on our that, show, can I still say my favorite? Do we still have time to say my favorite? But you still missed it. You still missed one of the most important E's. Yeah, please. entrepreneurs. I'm talking about well, of entrepreneurs. course, entrepreneurs. Well, well but if you didn't listen to the show, you don't know. Okay. All right, so now, you know, you know. Grease, grease lightning is electrifying, and so are we. Even if we're the only two that think so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, <laughs> we probably could go see a psychiatrist. All right, so let's go now to our guest. And I'm going to hope I pronounce her name correctly. So if I do, this is my first time pronouncing her name. Okay, and my understanding is this is Krissa McFallon. Is that correct? Yes, you did a great job. All right. Oh, don't tell him that. His, the ego is already out of control. <laughs> and, and, and by the way, there is an E in, at the end of her name. All right, so uh, <laughs> sorry it took us a long time to get here. <laughs> We've been spending a lot of time on the E's more so than normal. But the question is, you have a company, and the name of the company is called Patientories. Kind of like, sounds almost like a combination of inventory and patient. So why don't you explain what Patientory is? Yeah, no, that's correct. We I've gotten patient story, patient repository. But patientory is a digital health data wallet that securely aggregates health data for patients, their wearable devices, electronic medical records in a secure wallet on their phone, which also enables them to monetize that data for clinical studies and research. Wow, wow, that's very interesting. And you brought up a whole bunch of issues there. Before we get into patient tour, I just want to go quickly about your background. Be, uh, before you before you got involved with patient tour, uh, what was your background? Yeah, uh, so prior to this, prior to starting patient tour, I had already made my way into the digital healthcare startup world. I was managing a telemedicine company almost 10 years ago when that was new and people were wondering why they needed to talk to their doctors over an app. Um, but prior to that, I was in consulting on a lot of new emerging tech. Wow. Wow. That's, that's interesting. And uh, so uh, now telemedicine uh, really got big over, I guess, since 2020. So I guess the company that you were working with, are they still around and did they get really big after 2020 with COVID, or were they already so big it didn't really matter at that point? They actually ended up selling in 2017, so they didn't wow. get around to see COVID. Yeah, they got acquired. Well, I guess they got probably pretty happy that they got acquired, but I'm sure that the valuation probably went up quite a bit in 2020 when people's when things like telemedicine became really, really big. 
but uh, yeah. I'm sure they did okay if they sold. So uh, w- when did you come up with this concept, patient jewelry? Around 2015-ish. You know, I, we were having trouble on, on the telemedicine platform just getting access to patient data, was really looking at solutions, was coming across new technologies. Um, and that's when I, you know, decided to go off and, and really dig deep and start Patientory. Wow. And did you start it alone or did you have other people involved? Well, I was a sole founder. My co-founder came on about eight months after. And what was your they background? When I say background, okay, um, you know, for instance, within even the medical uh, telemedicine area, you could be involved in tech technology, you can be involved in marketing, sales. What what category would best fit you uh, with your prior experience? Yeah, so my experience, I was always in strategy. Well, in, in that prior experience, I was in management, so I was like the product owner for the app. So while I wasn't coding, you know, I wasn't on the technical side, I was like in between, you know, and product owners would know that they're they're in between, you know, product, tech, and marketing. And then, uh, so you started it alone. Uh, um, and did you have any seed money? How did you? How did you? You know, how did you fund yourself in the beginning? For patient tory. Yes. Um. So we our first investment came out of an accelerator that was backed by Kaiser Permanente. Um, so that was our initial, like, angel seed to really, you know, conceptualize the product, do enough customer interviews, and really get something on paper. And uh, explain to people what patient tory is. You, you mentioned it earlier about the medical records, et cetera, and that it's kind of like a wallet and that you can also sell the data to people. But, I mean, first of all, how, how did you uh, – obviously, it's – the technology is really important to ever. First of all, how did you attract users in the beginning? I mean, nobody knew who you were. How did you do that? Did you have a connection to Kaiser where they notified people to join? Did you, I mean, what, what, how did you get your first beginning people to, to join Patientory? Yeah, well, a lot of them, because we are a web, we also are a web three company. So we're using new innovative technologies like blockchain to really secure the database and, you know, do identity management. So a lot of our users came from that industry. We did trade show and events, you know, active speaking, where we saw a lot of patient advocates, right, that were really concerned about their health and and wanted to go to industry trade shows to really have that voice of the patient. Um, You know, so they became some of our biggest supporters, as well as partnerships through accelerators, um, I mentioned like a Kaiser. Um, all of, they didn't do much co-marketing. It was really down to the the people that we had as like early beta testers, right? Um, that would then join on to the platform. So a challenge I would think for a company like yourself, and you know, I have a legal and an accounting background, but also know a little bit about HIPAA. Is I would think that people would be concerned about the data that they're providing. You know that you know somebody hacks in or somebody gets all your medical records. I would think that would be a concern. Was that a concern, or and is that a concern to your users? And how do you how do you help protect that? Yeah. So our job is to really educate people on our technology and, and why this is pretty. It's so secure. Then you signing up for another centralized platform that owns your information and they centrally store it. So the biggest piece and why we have users, empower users to, to aggregate and own their data is because it's what we call decentralized. So our company doesn't store any of that information. The information comes directly from a hospital system, EMR, and the user is the only one that can unlock their record with a 23 numeric, um, mnemonic code. Um, that's specific to them. Well, and and um, you mentioned so. First of all, a this is uh, available on both the Android and the iPhone. Yes, it is. And um, uh, I, I know that a lot of 
people are using their watches, not just the Apple Watch, which is pretty popular for health, but also, you know, you've got the Fitbit and even Garmin and other companies out there have that. Have you gotten, gotten into those markets yet, or is that coming? We have. We currently integrate with Apple Fit, with Apple Watch, Apple Health, and Google Fitbit today. So if, you know, you're using any of those trackers, you can also integrate it on the app. And what's really useful about that, you know, we're now in the age of digital trackers. Everyone is tracking their steps. But with our application, we're incentivizing people, you know, through a care plan, you know, so they're tracking their steps. Now they can actually be rewarded for those steps as well. And what's the typical remuneration? What is that? What's a typical remuneration? What, how do users uh, receive monies, and typically, what what amount do they receive per per participation in a in a testing? Yeah, so the way it's done, it's through. I'm not sure you guys are familiar with like NFTs and tokens. So there's a token specific to the patientory wallet. It's called TTOI tokens. Um, so after each, I would say, 90 days or so based on a user's progress, they receive those digital tokens. Some of them can range anywhere from 15 to $30 in their wallet. They can, you know, trade it out for cash or they can keep the tokens in their wallet. And uh, tough question, but so how do you guys make money? How does the make money? Yeah, so I mentioned, you know, we help users once their data is in the wallet connect them with clinical research trials and organizations. So that is a, a B2B model where we're essentially, you know, structured it as a data marketplace um, where we're helping organizations such as pharmaceutical companies gain secure, unidentified data um, for their studies and helping them to find and recruit qualified patients for clinical trials. And um, we have about 30 seconds left before we have to go to break. Uh, what has been your biggest challenge in this business? I mean, in healthcare, and we saw it in telemedicine, it's, it's always slow to adopt new technologies until something dire, like the pandemic comes around that enables, you know, that type of opportunity. So with, with patient tour, you know, it's been, we've seen companies try and, and try to do a patient wallet like Google Health, Microsoft Health Vault Fail, who pretty much they were early, but now we see the tide is changing in terms of regulations, right? We're coming uh, upon AI, which is needed in healthcare, especially as is it, it being the second largest expense in the country. Um, so we, we need new solutions, right, to, to better manage our health. Okay, we're going to take a break. You listen to the S Barn Radio Show on KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You listen to the S Barn Radio Show on KHS 1220 98.1 FM. Like no other station in the world. All right, Tracy, you're on. <laughs> it's hard to follow that. Gee, um, I'm enthusiastic. Okay. Yes, you are, and excited, um, and I'm excited because I want to dig into. Um, I love everything that you shared you know, so far on the show, Krista. And you know, one of the things that you hear a lot is uh, team teamwork makes the dream work. And I like to really dig into like what what kind of team are you working with right now, and how has that grown since you started? And where do you see your team building out from here? Yeah, well, our team is pretty really heavy R&D, you know, research and development based. When we started out, it was more consultants, you know, really trying to figure out what, how can we just disrupt the space as quickly, cost efficiently as possible. So, so I surrounded myself with a lot of, healthcare expertise. Since then, it's grown to where, you know, we have to build this thing, right? We're building an entire healthcare blockchain ecosystem from scratch. So a lot of developers, coders, 
Um, now, as we're starting to continue on our journey and build out, you know, what we're, we're seeing um, a lot more marketing resources join our team um, and support with, like, you know, apps, um, you know, maintenance, you know, getting the branding and awareness out there, especially we're building in a new industry, right? So making sure that it resonates with people, they can understand it. Um, So, no, we've really transformed over the past couple of years based on our development um, and building out the company. And as the person who's running all of this and the head of all of this, what have been some of your biggest challenges in terms of building out the team? Has it been around recruitment, management? Uh, what are you seeing as some of your challenges in that way? I would say building, looking at building a startup team is always going to be the biggest challenge. And, you know, we had a challenge finding the right people, right? That, that took us some time. Then, you know, we had a challenge in just, you know, culture until we kind of got into our groove in terms of, like, the type of persona that we needed on the team. At, the, at that time, you know, we would bring in, you know, former CEOs of big, large corporations that just couldn't adopt to the, the scrappiness of, of being in a startup. And we had to really face that early on. Yeah, I think that's such a good point, and and I really want to highlight that for a moment because not enough founders talk about this, and so I'm really glad that you mentioned it because there is a completely different culture. If you are a CTO, a COO, a CRO from a corporate background and you make a shift to a startup, it is so different, right? Like, it is yeah. culturally different. It is budget different. It is, I mean, share a little bit more I about that. Lifestyle. <laughs> lifestyle different, yes. And I just, I just don't think we talk enough about that because I think people think of it as going from startup to corporate, but nobody really talks about the shift from corporate to startup. And it is a very difficult transition to make. Yeah, especially coming from corporate, you know, you're comfortable, you know, it's you're basically optimizing for an already built product. There's just a lot more moving parts in the startup, and you're not siloed to just one department, right, one function, as in large corporations. Most of the time, especially if the startup is at least three years old, you're going to be finding yourself doing multiple different tasks across across the company. Right, and you may not be used to that because you may be used to having an assistant, having tech support, having a janitor. Exactly. (laughs) Just the simple things, right? Um, And then you get into this environment, and and I think a lot of people realize it's not for them, and I think it's so important to maybe have those conversations and set those expectations on the front end, but I think if you're not aware that's even a risk, you know, maybe just don't even think to have the conversation. Exactly. And I feel there was like a big surge into startups like five years ago because of just the successes of IPOs, M&As that really attracted a lot of corporate, you know, individuals and they realized that, you know, it's not for everyone. And certainly not for the faint of heart. That is for sure. <laughs> we need to create an E-word that defines not for the faint of heart. I don't know what that would be. But um, but it sounds like you've got a really great hold on it. So um, I found something interesting in your bio that I wanted to ask you about because it also appears that you are, or you may want to confirm or deny this, but are yeah. you fluent in Spanish? I am. I did my study abroad in southern Spain almost 13 years ago, but I grew up in New York City, so a lot of my friends were Dominican, Puerto Rican. I, you know, grew up even just learning Spanish in my neighborhood. And I just can't imagine how, what a great benefit that must be for you in, in as being a healthcare visionary executive as you are now that you have this bilingual component. It has helped, not so much, not too much in Georgia, but no, it has. 
Um, and, you know, I, I've done medical missions in Central America. So, you know, that helps with the language barrier. You know, even outside of, of just, you know, the, you know, working in, in, in health tech, mm-hmm. but, you know, my mission of really transforming and, and leaving an impact in healthcare, um, that helped a lot. Yes, and I think as the, as the company continues to expand in the, with a larger global footprint than it already has, I can't imagine that that's not going to also continue to serve you well. And even in, from a recruitment perspective, at some point when you need to expand your team in that area, you, you don't have to overcome that barrier of communication. Exactly. So um, I do believe we're getting ready to be um, – it's pausing the conversation to talk to our sponsor. Peter, um, are we ready for that? Uh, well, I'm just waiting for yeah. Stephanie to be on. I'm here. here. Oh, you are. Okay. Can you guys hear me? <laughs> now yes. I can hear you. Okay. Yes. So Hi. <laughs> each week our show is sponsored by two different companies, and we have our spokesperson, the fabulous Stephanie. So, Stephanie, how you doing? I'm good. How are you guys? All right. So, a uh, couple questions. So, uh, one of the companies that sponsors the show is called Albany Farms. And for viewers who never listened to our show, they want to know what is Albany Farms all about. So, what is Albany Farms about? I mean, can I buy eggs there, or what? What is Albany Farms? <laughs> <laughs> no, no eggs, but you can buy ramen noodles. So, do you like ramen? Of course. Who doesn't like ramen? I know, right? (laughs) Um, But, yeah, Albany Farms is a food manufacturer. We're actually a startup company, um, and we're located in Belfouche, South Dakota, um, beautiful state right near the wheat. Um, We consume a lot of wheat, since our main product is ramen. That's not too far from from Wyoming, right? Yeah, that's correct, and uh, very close to North Dakota and Canada. I know there's fires up in Canada, so we definitely have uh, the poor air quality right now. Well, I think a lot of us do. I'm in New York, and I have that. So what, what question we have is, um, who are you selling ramen to? Yeah, great question. So right now um, we are working with four retail customers, and you can find us at select Walmart Canada stores. And in the U.S., you can find us at select Target, H-E-B, and Dollar Tree stores. So the Walmart stores in Canada must have a lot of, uh, a lot of smoke from those wildfires, I guess. That's yes, I, can, uh, I would imagine so. They might even have, have, have smoke on the, on the uh, ramen noodles themselves, on the packages. All right, so the other company that sponsors the show is called Legal Steps. I know you took their course. And so why don't you explain to people what Legal Steps is all about? Yeah. So Legal Steps is a do-it-yourself system um, to help you navigate certain legal issues like forming a business in California or even registering a federal trademark. I found that these classes were affordable, um, and it really left me feeling empowered and confident. Um, So I would definitely say that it makes legal easy for everybody. Wow. So it kind of levels the playing field. That's interesting. Um, And you don't have to spend $5,000 to a lawyer. Wow, that's a great thing. So, Stephanie, hopefully you'll stay away from the uh, smoke from the fires in South Dakota. Uh, In the meantime, uh, until next week, we appreciate it, and uh, we're going to go right back to our show. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. All right. Uh, We'll speak to you next week. Back to the Ask Ryan Show. Thanks. Back to the Ask Ryan Show on KCS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Tracy, you were asking a question. You hadn't finished. Yeah, so we were talking about team building and leadership and all of those great things. Throw in a, a little um, bilingual advantages to your leadership, which is fantastic. And so now I want to pivot a bit because I'm pretty much known for the pivot um, to talk through how you're growing the business from a marketing perspective. What are what have you done organically as a startup, and then how have you grown? your marketing um, efforts and strategy. Yeah, well, campaigns have worked really well for us. Um, Both digital campaigns we run across, you know, 
sites such as Google, Facebook, and we have influencer campaigns that we just launched a couple of weeks back, and, and we a couple of weeks back, and we realized that you know this really helped us get a niche on you know new users to the website. You know, we we launched one on TikTok that saw over sixty thousand you know likes and over a hundred thousand views. So you know, campaigns have worked really well for us. We're looking to continue to build on that, um, as well as, you know, partnerships. So we have a couple of co-marketing partnerships um, that we've done with organizations such as United Networks of America. They have they have over 30 million patients in their network. Um, and we're looking to expand out, you know, to more consumer businesses that can also take advantage of our application to help build our numbers. And I just happen to know this because, um, well, you probably don't know this, but because I'm in a podcast production company, we were having a conversation offline about podcasting, and you were saying that you often guest on a lot of podcasts, which I think is a fantastic marketing strategy. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you got into guesting on podcasts and what kind of benefit that you've seen from, from utilizing podcasts as part of your marketing strategy? Yeah, at first it was part of like our PR initiative and I, I it seems as if I was like once you start to do a couple then you know the the floodgates just just open in. Like we will get requests for podcasts, you know, frequently, like monthly. So that's something that has really helped in just our brand and, and that awareness um, that we continually, you know, take advantage of as well. And, and and just by you being on our show today, I can say I'm sure you're a great guest on other podcasts, and I'm sure that's working really well for you. Um, so between the marketing efforts that you're doing, speaking to other podcast audiences, radio show interviews, the digital campaigns that you're talking about, and the influencer campaigns, they're all really great strategic ways to grow the brand awareness. But when it comes to building your personal brand, I can tell that you're really involved in incubators and community, um, an entrepreneur community uh, type uh, of organizations like EY. And how has it benefited you as an entrepreneur to be connected to a community of like-minded entrepreneurs? Yeah, no, it, I mean, I think the biggest thing a startup founder can do is have a great community, right? Because you're not going to know all of the answers. And being connected to, you know, these prestigious organizations like EY, who probably has a connection to someone down the line that I would want to be connected with, right? And it's easy to, to go and knock on their door and, and ask for help. So, you know, that's a strategy that I continue to use, especially in being invited to entrepreneur groups like that where they're highlighting, you know, the best and the brightest, but really impactful businesses. So they're, they're also helping to build that awareness as well. Um, personally, you know, as a thought leader in the space, I write for Forbes, um, Forbes Web3, so that's something I do active as well. Um, I've written a book on future women and the role of minority woman entrepreneurship. Like, these are all different tactics that can be used to continue to build the brand, but also build the influence. And then I would imagine, too, like you were saying, um, in this respect, what we were saying, even about the culture between a corporate environment and an entrepreneurial startup environment, is that um, it's so important to be around your people, like people who get what you're going through, because um, running a, a, a startup, especially a tech startup, it just takes a lot of grit, it takes a lot of tenaciousness, and not everybody understands what's really involved in building a business to the magnitude of what you're building. We're going to hold off on that on that answer because we're going to be taking a break. <laughs> Listen, to KSS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Welcome back. You're listening to the Ask Brian Radio Show on KSS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Now, if you were listening to the show, Tracy had a nice long question, and then, we had to tie it back. 
<laughs> Let's see how good a memory Tracy had. <laughs> okay, well, I think I was making a nice long point that I was trying to turn into a question, which is, you know, just one of my normal soapboxes. I usually have at least one soapbox per episode. And this soapbox was how not everyone understands how dang difficult it is to run a startup. And what I was, the point I was trying to make was that sometimes we think our, our biggest supporters are going to be like our family and our friends and the people that love us, but really they, they might realize that we're foreign beings when it comes to a startup. So what I was asking <laughs> was that um, how important is it to you, Krista, to connect with other like-minded entrepreneurs to give you that support that you need when you're going through the, the trenches of all this? It is real. It's as equally as important, you know, you know, as everything else in the business, right? Because it can be lonely, it can be isolated, and learning from your peers, learning from others that are building companies, you know, they're going through the same exact thing, and you can see something that may help them, and they may see something that may help you, right? So, it's a good balance, in because I've heard so many stories of founders that they think they can do it, they go 100%, and they just burn out, because they didn't have an ecosystem, you know, they didn't rely on, on having balance, right? Um, and it, it's important to, to take it in stride, too, knowing that building something new is not going to come overnight. Yes, gosh, that is, it is definitely, it is not a sprint, it is a marathon. Well, you yes. have been such a fantastic guest, and I know that people will love to, um, or really want to possibly reach out to you, continue this conversation in some way. What is the best way, Krista, for people to learn more about uh, or connect with you and then obviously learn more and be um, a part of your fabulous company? Absolutely. Well, I actively tweet. You can find me on Twitter, Krista McFarland. I also have a website, com. You can learn more about my entrepreneurship, books, and, you know, feel free to, to email me at chrisatpatientory.com, where you can also follow our company and what we're up to, all the new announcements and, and big partnerships um, at social media on, at Patientory. And Patientory, for, these, for those of you who are listening, it's spelled P-A-T-I-E-N-T-O-R-Y, Patientory. And if you are in a place where you can't write that down, we'll have that in the show notes for you on the podcast. And if you didn't know we had a podcast, well, guess what? We do. And you can get the, you can have the ability to listen to this episode and tons of previous episodes of the Ask Brian radio show. And it is the Ask Brian podcast, and that's A-S-K-B-R-I-E-N, Ask Brian podcast. Find it, download it, follow it, share it with all your friends, wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And I have enjoyed talking with you so much. And, Peter, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Well, thanks a lot, Tracy. So uh, we do have a couple of quick questions. Um, what do you think is the most important attribute of somebody that's starting a business? I would say perseverance. Um, you're going to have the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, and you can't let either of them determine, you know, your success or failure. So really getting over, you know, the, the rockiness and hurdles is what sets apart, you know, entrepreneurs that win and, and those that feel, you know, they want to go after another you know, shiny new object or, or go back to working in corporate. I think perseverance is one of the most, you know, biggest, I would say, underrated traits in entrepreneurship. And question we have is, um, so perseverance is important. Some people have told me that, believe it or not, and it sounds kind of old-fashioned, but, you know, money is the most important factor because you can persevere, but if you run out of money, you're not going to be able to continue. What do you think about that? That's true. And, I mean, if you're building a business, you're basically exchanging something for money. So you're going to have to find it somewhere or the other. You have to persevere to find it. Um, 
And I, I think, you know, going, starting a business and knowing that I'm starting a business because a business is something that makes money, it should always be at the forefront and the priority. And if you persevere, like, you always get, you know, that first check or, you know, a check if you're further down the line and building that business. Well, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, we'll have you on another show down the road, especially to see how you've grown and how the company is expanded in the next couple of years. We'll probably have a, a show probably in the next six months to a year. Uh, we appreciate your time. And uh, as we said, the podcast will be available uh, probably another week or two. Thanks again. Uh, over and out. And thank you very much for all our listeners. KHS 1220 and 98.1 FM. Thank you, Chrissy. Thank you, Tracy. And until next week, over and out.